We're excited to have Dr. Juan Latora give today's lecture. Dr. Latora received his medical degree from the National University of the Northeast in Argentina and received a PhD in pharmacology from Tulane University. Dr. Latora is currently an adjunct professor of medicine at Duke University and Louisiana State University. Previously, Dr. Latora was a faculty member at the Clinical Pharmacology Center, Northwestern University. Between 1981 and 2006, he was professor of medicine and pharmacology at Tulane University School of Medicine. Dr. Latora joined the NIH Clinical Center in 2006 as the director of clinical pharmacology program and led this course, The Principles of Clinical Pharmacology, until his retirement from the NIH in 2016. Please enjoy the presentation. Welcome to Principles of Clinical Pharmacology. Uh, my name is Juan Lertora, and today I will present an overview of the discipline of clinical pharmacology, and I also will introduce the basic concepts in pharmacokinetics and its clinical applications. The focus of the course traditionally has been on the scientific basis of drug use, development, and evaluation. We do not consider this to be a course in therapeutics, but of course there will be relevant examples uh, of applications of clinical pharmacology in, in therapeutics. Uh, we will discuss general principles that are applicable to both old and new drugs. Uh, there is a textbook uh, that has been used for this course for a number of years, uh, Principles of Clinical Pharmacology. The lead editor is Dr. Arthur J. Atkinson, Jr. So, uh, let us see an outline of what I would like uh, to cover for you today. Uh, in the first part, uh, we will have an overview uh, addressing the general scope of the discipline, uh, some uh, brief historical notes. Uh, we will talk about what do clinical pharmacologists engage in as professionals. We will emphasize the topic of variability in drug response as an area of great interest uh, in our field. Uh, also, adverse drug reactions and their impact both in terms of drug development and clinical use of drugs. And finally, a, a brief overview of drug development. So let's uh, move on then and define pharmacology as the study of drugs and biologics and their actions in living organisms. Uh, generally, when we talk about drugs, we think of small molecules, chemical agents. Uh, when we talk about biologics, we're thinking about large molecules, uh, peptides, and uh, antibodies. The most basic definition of our field is that clinical pharmacology is the study of drugs and biologics in humans. The discipline really spans the spectrum of drug discovery, drug development, drug utilization, and drug regulation. We aim in clinical pharmacology, we aim at advancing therapeutics in humans with mechanistic understanding of drug actions. This is an area termed pharmacodynamics and also drug disposition. And that is, of course, the subject of uh, pharmacokinetics. Now, you know, of course, uh, the concept of translational sciences and how much it has been emphasized uh, for the last decade or so. Uh, basically, we talk about knowledge that has been acquired in animal or in silico models of disease 
or through ex vivo studies in human tissues or in vivo studies in healthy or diseased humans that then is translated into effective treatment for patients. Clinical pharmacology is a translational discipline essential for drug development and therapeutics in humans. Now a bit of history uh, focusing on the founders of American clinical pharmacology. I'm talking about Drs. Harry Gold and Dr. Walter Modell at Cornell University. And this is a partial list of their accomplishments and uh, fundamental contributions, uh, introducing the double-blind clinical trial design in 1937, uh, initiating the Cornell Conference on Therapy a couple of years later, and in the early 50s, analyzing dejoxing effect kinetics to estimate the absolute bioavailability as well as the time course of the chronotropic effects of dejoxing. Uh, we'll come back to this example later in the talk. And in 1960, they founded the journal Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, which is today, of course, a leading journal uh, in the discipline. Now, at the NIH, uh, we should mention Dr. Albert Scherzma, who headed the experimental, experimental therapeutic branch at the National Heart Institute uh, from 1958 through 1971. <clears throat> he uh, trained uh, individuals of the stature of Lou Gillespie, John Oates, Leon Goldberg, Richard Kraut, Ken Melmon, and many others uh, that subsequently uh, became uh, leaders in the discipline as well. Their research focused on serotonin and the carcinoid syndrome, uh, pheochromocytoma, antihypertensive drugs, and, and many other uh, contributions. Now, what are the professional goals of clinical pharmacologists? Well, we are interested in the discovery, development, evaluation of new medicines and how their use is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States and other regulatory agents in other countries. We are also interested in optimizing the use of existing medicines and often finding new indications for all drugs. But as I mentioned in our initial ag outline, uh, a critical area of interest to clinical pharmacologists is to define the basis for variability in therapeutic and toxic responses uh, to medicine. Uh, and this is an example uh, looking at uh, the exposure to two anti-diabetic drugs uh, pioglitazone on the left uh, side of the slide and metformin on the right hand side and we're looking at drug exposure in terms of the area under the plasma concentration time versus time curve and uh, this is an AUC area under the curve that has been normalized to a 15 milligram dose of pioglitazone and a 500 milligram dose of metformin, uh, and also uh, normalized to 70 kilograms of body weight uh, for uh, a human uh, patient. And you see the great uh, variability that we see in drug exposure, both in females and males, uh, in the case of both of these anti-diabetic agents. So that's one of the challenges clinical pharmacologists uh, face uh, in trying to understand the basis for this variability in drug exposure and how it may impact on the uh, therapeutic uh, actions uh, of the drug. Another source of variability in drug exposure 
may relate to underlying genetic variants. In this instance, we are using the example of nortriptyline, uh, a tricyclic antidepressant that has been in use for many years, and the impact of cytochrome P452D6 polymorphism. And uh, here we are plotting plasma concentration of nortriptyline after a 25 milligram dose uh, over time. And then we see the impact of the number of functional genes for CYP2D6. Uh, the first curve on top uh, indicates a higher exposure for an individual that does not express uh, CYP2D6 and uh, actually, uh, by definition, is a very slow metabolizer of this drug. And then the uh, progressively uh, smaller area under the curve with increasing numbers of CYP2D6 functional genes. This over here uh, at the bottom uh, is an individual with 13 copies of the gene that uh, is uh, also an ultra rapid metabolizer of this drug. So another source of variation in drug exposure and of course potentially on therapeutic uh, efficacy of drugs uh, uh, in terms of this uh, pharmacogenetically determined uh, variation in drug exposure. Now let's turn to another major area of interest in clinical pharmacology, namely uh, adverse uh, drug reaction. Some toxicities of drugs can be managed and may be acceptable based on a risk-benefit ratio, but other uh, adverse reactions and toxicities by their nature and severity are really unacceptable and those drugs uh, either have to be removed from clinical use or used with great caution and adherence to uh, significant uh, uh, and close monitoring of the patients. Uh, we need to understand of course that risk benefit is contextual depending on the drug and the disease that we intend to treat. Uh, it is not the same uh, to consider uh, potentially serious toxicity for a drug intended to treat hypertension, uh, which is a condition that needs lifelong uh, therapy, uh, compared to, say, uh, treatment of cancer, uh, a disease that is potentially lethal over the short term and that requires uh, very intense treatment with combination of drugs that have very significant uh, toxicity. So again, risk benefit is contextual uh, and we must consider the drug in question and the disease that we uh, are uh, intending to treat. Uh, uh, now again, in terms of genetics, uh, as it may relate to severe drug toxicity, now this is uh, uh, a condition or situations, if you will, where an underlying genetic variant may predispose individuals to severe toxicity from drugs. Uh, here we have the examples of HLA B5701, uh, individuals that carry this HLA variant are at very high risk of a back of your hypersensitivity. Abacavir is a drug uh, used in the treatment of HIV infection and AIDS and uh, prior to instituting treatment with Abacavir, every patient is first tested for this variant uh, HLA B5701. If they have the variant, they cannot be treated with that drug and an alternative must be found. Uh, the next example that we show here is that of HLA B1502. Uh, predisposing to severe uh, carbamazepine-induced Stevens-Johnson syndrome. This is a serious cutaneous adverse drug reaction uh, that actually can be fatal. So uh, once again, 
the uh, underlying genetic variants uh, conferring uh, predisposition to severe uh, drug uh, toxicity. Another example of unacceptable drug toxicity is that of torsade the points. What we're showing here is an electrocardiographic uh, uh, record uh, of heart rhythm in a patient that suffered uh, from an episode of this uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. This is a very abnormal rhythm. Uh, you can see here a normal beat, if you will, uh, in the electrocardiogram preceding these runs of polymorphic uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia that is actually drug-induced. So this is another example of a potentially life-threatening uh, adverse reaction from drugs. And uh, here I'm showing terfenidine, which historically was uh, the first non-sedating antihistamine that was uh, introduced uh, in the United States uh, market uh, under the brand name of Seldane, but was subsequently withdrawn from the market because of the risk of drug-induced uh, arrhythmias. Now, look at the metabolic transformation of terfenidine uh, in humans and the production of terfenidine carboxylate as a metabolite. Very interestingly, this metabolite is active. It also has this antihistamine uh, pharmacological action, uh, and it's also a non-sedating antihistamine, but terfenidine, which is marketed as Allegra, does not have the risk of a drug-induced arrhythmia like torsade the point. And this again uh, brings us to consider and remember the importance of studying drug metabolism and assessing whether metabolites are also pharmacologically active or are otherwise uh, inactive uh, once biotransformation has taken place. Uh, let me uh, bring you the example of thalidomide. Uh, again, in terms of uh, unacceptable drug toxicities, uh, but actually with a very interesting history, as I will show you in a moment. Uh, thalidomide was introduced in the 1960s as a sedative and actually was prescribed as an anti-nausea medication to pregnant women. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, in many countries, although not in the U.S., because uh, uh, thalidomide was not approved in the United States and actually was not allowed to enter the market at the time because of the discovery of some severe uh, toxicity to uh, uh, unborn children due to prenatal drug exposure. Uh, this led to an epidemic worldwide of focomilia, uh, children born with severe defects in terms of their limbs. And, and of course, this is a, a very uh, uh, unfortunate outcome of the use of that drug in pregnant women. Uh, now, there were consequences to this thalidomide crisis. Uh, for one thing, the uh, uh, United States Congress approved the Kefauver Harris Amendments in 1962 that instituted new and more strict FDA regulations to establish whether drugs were on the one hand effective but uh, safe. And, and uh, the process that uh, uh, has been modernized over the years, but again, emphasizing safety and demonstrating efficacy of drugs before they're allowed uh, into the market. The Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences began to review therapeutic claims at that time, and uh, also more research on the causes of adverse drug reactions uh, was encouraged. And the National Institute of General Medical Sciences created a number of clinical pharmacology centers in the United States to uh, 
uh, again uh, implement uh, rational drug development uh, to establish the scientific basis of drug use uh, in, in clinical medicine and uh, 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 again sadly uh, as a consequence of this major uh, thalidomide uh, crisis. So our discipline is eminently uh, involved in the development and evaluation of new drugs. Uh, we start with drug discovery and this is a process in itself uh, that we will be addressed in detail in another session of this course. Uh, then we have preclinical, uh, meaning uh, animal testing uh, of candidate drugs and eventually clinical evaluation uh, to demonstrate safety in humans and uh, whether or not the drug is effective in a given uh, clinical condition. Uh, but then we also have post-marketing studies. Uh, once the drug enters the market, we continue to evaluate uh, for the possibility of rare adverse drug reactions that were not discovered uh, in the uh, pre-approval uh, uh, stage and also uh, performing studies in special populations like the elderly and, and in, in children. Now this is a schematic of pre-marketing drug development. Uh, you see here the phase of preclinical development. Uh, we have animal models, we have assay development, we study pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in animals. We of course uh, begin to study animal toxicology in the short term and the long term if the drug is intended for chronic use and once uh, a package of information is developed that indicates that the candidate drug may in fact be promising uh, an investigation of new drug application the IND is filed with the Food and Drug Administration or other regulatory agencies and then we begin the process of evaluating drugs in humans uh, typically considered as uh, phase one, first dose in human studies, dose escalations to assess uh, tolerance, uh, phase two when we do the proof of concept studies uh, treating patients with a condition that may benefit uh, potentially from the drugs and phase three the large uh, uh, randomized uh, clinical trials comparing the new drug to a placebo or to uh, a previously uh, established uh, therapy. Uh, and that then leads to the submission of a new drug application or NDA uh, where the sponsor uh, asks the regulatory agents to review this body of evidence and request approval for marketing the drug and to begin uh, uh, using the drug in clinical practice. Uh, one way to look at the phases of drug development is with the learn and confirm paradigm. Uh, the late Dr. Lou Shiner and his colleagues uh, advocated this approach. Uh, phase one and phase two are the learning phases of drug development. Phase three is the confirm confirmatory phase and phase four again is the post-marketing phase but learning continues uh, focusing on rare adverse drug reactions and special populations if required. Now let's talk for a moment about drug repurposing. Uh, this is an area where the National Institutes of Health and, and uh, other uh, academic investigators uh, have been very interested in uh, and that has to do with finding new biological targets and new therapeutic indications for all drugs. Uh, what are the potential advantages of this approach? Well for one thing it may shorten drug development time. Uh, we already know a lot about the safety of the drug and we also have data in terms of the human 
pharmacokinetic behavior of the drug. And uh, uh, drug repurposing then, and this is the concept of, of Dr. Austin at NCATS, uh, is uh, illustrated uh, in this fashion. Now, typically we have a process of drug screening of uh, thousands of compounds and the whole process may take 10 years uh, between uh, identifying uh, the target agent and performing all the preclinical and clinical uh, phases of drug development uh, that may then lead to drug approval. Uh, what if then through repurposing of a much smaller a number of drugs that have been in use for other indications uh, uh, could uh, perhaps uh, shorten the period of drug development to a couple of years. Now this is ideal but conceptually uh, again very important. And we do have examples of a number of drugs that have been repurposed. And uh, very interestingly we have again thalidomide extremely toxic and forbidden uh, in uh, pregnant females. But nevertheless, through the uh, clinical observation of a physician in the 1960s, uh, it became a very useful agent to lead, or rather to treat, a complication of leprosy called erythema nodosum leprosum. Uh, so uh, again, uh, a drug that otherwise was banned from marketing becomes now useful in a clinical condition like erythema nodosum leprosum. Uh, years later, uh, the drug was actually studied in the condition of multiple myeloma, uh, again a form of cancer, uh, this time uh, through targeted drug development. Uh, in any case, these are now two FDA approved indications. This is an immunomodulatory agent. Marketing is done under a very special and very restricted distribution program uh, referred to as System for Thalidomide Education and Prescribing. Uh, but uh, a very good example of drug repurposing. And uh, in this slide I show you a list of drugs that were uh, approved originally for a different indication, uh, but now are FDA approved for indications uh, that, uh, for example, for sildenafil uh, include uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, lamotrigine being used for bipolar disorder, and, and so forth. So again, repurposing as a viable and, and potentially uh, very important uh, way to look at uh, finding uh, new uh, indications uh, for all drugs.